The poor traveler part too. Well, they were happy. It was a long recovery, but they were happy through it all. The snow had melted on the ground, and the birds were singing in the leafless thickets of the early spring, when those three were first able to ride out together, and when people flocked about the open carriage to cheer and congratulate Captain Richard Doubledick, but even then it became necessary for the captain, instead of returning to England, to complete his recovery in the climate of southern France. They found a spot upon the Rhone, within a ride of the old town of Avignon, and within view of its broken bridge, which was all they could desire, they lived there, together, six months, then returned to England. Mrs. Taunton, growing old after three years, though not so old as that her bright, dark eyes were dimmed, and remembering that her strength had been benefited by the change, resolved to go back for a year to those parts. So she went with a faithful servant, who had often carried her son in his arms, and she was to be rejoined and escorted home, at the year's end, by Captain Richard Doubledick. She wrote regularly to her children, as she called them now, and they to her. She went to the neighborhood of X, and there, in their own chateau near the farmer's house she rented, she grew into intimacy with a family belonging to that part of France. The intimacy began in her often meeting among the vineyards of Pretty Child, a girl with a most compassionate heart, who was never tired of listening to the solitary English lady's stories of her poor son and the cruel wars. The family were as gentle as the child, and at length she came to know them so well that she accepted their invitation to pass the last month of her residence abroad under their roof. All this intelligence she wrote home, piecemeal as it came about, from time to time, and at last enclosed a polite note, from the head of the chateau, soliciting, on the occasion of his approaching mission to that neighborhood, the honor of the company of that man so justly celebrated, Captain Richard Doubledick. Captain Doubledick, now a hearty, handsome man in the full vigor of life, broader across the chest and shoulders than he had ever been before, dispatched a courteous reply, and followed it in person. Traveling through all that extent of country after three years of peace, he blessed the better days on which the world had fallen. The corn was golden, not drenched in unnatural red, was bound in sheaves for food, not trodden underfoot by men in mortal fight. The smoke rose up from peaceful hearts, not blazing ruins. The carts were laden with the fair fruits of the earth, not with wounds and death. To him who had so often seen the terrible reverse, these things were beautiful indeed, and they brought him in a softened spirit to the old chateau near X upon a deep blue evening. It was a large chateau of the genuine old ghostly kind, with round towers, and extinguishers, and a high leaden roof, and more windows than Aladdin's palace. The entrance doors stood open, as doors often do in that country when the heat of the day is past, and the captain saw no bell or knocker, and walked in. He walked into a lofty stone hall, refreshingly cool and gloomy after the glare of a southern day's travel. Extending along the four sides of this hall was a gallery, leading to suites of rooms, and it was lighted from the top. Still no bell was to be seen. Faith, said the captain, halting, ashamed of the clanking of his boots, this is a ghostly beginning, he started back, and felt his face turn white. In the gallery, looking down at him, stood the French officer, the officer whose picture he had carried in his mind so long and so far. Compared with the original, at last, in every lineament how like it was. He moved and disappeared, and Captain Richard Doubledick heard his steps coming quickly down into the hall. He entered through an archway. There was a bright, sudden look upon his face, much such a look as it had worn in that fatal moment. Monsieur le Capitaine Richard Doubledick? Enchanted to receive him, he has not remembered me, as I have remembered him, he did not take such a note of my face, that day, as I took of his, thought Captain Richard Doubledick. How shall I tell him, you were at Waterloo, said the French officer. I was, said Captain Richard Doubledick. And at Badajoz, left alone with the sound of his own stern voice in his ears, he sat down to consider. What shall I do, and how shall I tell him? At that time, unhappily, many deplorable duels had been fought between English and French officers arising out of the recent war, and these duels, and how to avoid this officer's hospitality, were the uppermost thought in Captain Richard Doubledick's mind. His mother, above all, the captain thought. How shall I tell her, spirit of my departed friend, said he, is it through thee these better thoughts are rising in my mind? Is it thou who hast shown me, all the way I have drawn to meet this man, the blessings of the altered time? Is it thou who hast sent thy stricken mother to me, to stay my angry hand? Is it from thee the whisper comes, that this man did his duty as thou didst, and as I did, through thy guidance, which has wholly saved me here on earth, and 
that he did no more, he sat down, with his head buried in his hands, and, when he rose up, made the second strong resolution in his life, that neither to the French officer, nor to the mother of his departed friend, nor to any soul, while either of the two was living, would he breathe what only he knew. And when he touched that French officer's glass with his own, that day at dinner, he secretly forgave him in the name of the divine forgiver of injuries. <laughs>